The Lord said to the lawyer, Thou art not far from the kingdom of heaven. I've entitled this message, How Far is Not Far. Thou art not far from the kingdom of heaven. Now, did this mean he was almost there? Just a nudge and he'd be in the kingdom of heaven? Just a small amount he lacked and if he could just get that, everything would be fine? I think of what the Lord said to the rich young ruler. Yet lackest thou one thing. And that one thing was everything. How far is not far? What is the different, the distance of how far is not far? Now the only way the scripture can be interpreted is by other scripture. That's so important. You know, I can show you verses of scripture where it's could be said to be a good thing to be far off. The, pub, the publican in the temple stood afar off. Not near like the Pharisee, but he stood afar off, beating on his breast, crying, God be merciful to me, the sinner. Uh, the prodigal went to a far country. When Peter was preaching on Pentecost, he said, the promise is to you and to your children, even to all that are afar off. The promise of God is to all. That's a broad statement, isn't it? The promise is to all that are afar off. And the Lord says to this man, you are not far from the kingdom of heaven. Now, the story begins in verse 28. And one of the scribes came, and having heard them reasoning together, speaking of the Pharisees and Sadducees who tried to trip up the Lord, and they both failed miserably, and perceiving that he had answered them well, asked him, which is the first commandment of all? Now hold your finger there and turn back to Matthew chapter 22 for just a moment. Let's read Matthew's account of this same story. Verse 35, then one of them which was a lawyer, called a scribe and Mark, but a lawyer here, asked him a question, tempting him. So this man did not have a good motive when he asked this question. He, like everybody else was, was trying to trip up the Lord, try to find some inconsistency in what he was saying. When he was asking about which is the greatest commandment, his uh, intention was to, well, what about this one? Are you showing favoritism? Are you setting one law above the other? He was looking for a contradiction in the Lord's words, just the way everybody else was during this time when they're bringing him these questions. And this man had an evil <coughs> motive in asking these questions. Let's go back to Mark. And one of the scribes came and having heard them reasoning together and perceiving that he'd answered him well, asked him, which is the first commandment of all? Which is the most important commandment? And Jesus answered him. And instead of giving the answer he was looking for, he gave a different kind of answer. He gave the commandment that comprehends all of the commandments. Look what he said, and Jesus answered him, the first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. And the second is like, namely this, 
Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There is none other commandments greater than these. As a matter of fact, in Matthew's account, the Lord said on these two commandments, hang all the law and all the prophets. Now this is how significant these commandments are. They cover everything. Now there are 613 laws written down in the Old Testament and every one of them are summarized by these two laws. Love God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. And then he quotes from Deuteronomy. This is from Deuteronomy. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Now, there's one Lord. There's one God. And this one God is revealed in three distinct, separate persons. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. One God in three distinct persons. Somebody says, explain that to me. That can't be explained. It can only be believed. It's brought on by revelation. We would never guess anything like this. Somebody, if somebody said, describe God, I wouldn't say, well, there's one God and three different persons if I hadn't read the Bible. The Bible reveals this with regard to God. He's one God in three distinct persons. Now, all three persons are equal one to another. It says the Lord Jesus Christ that he thought it not robbery. He thought it not a thing to be grasped for or reached for to be equal with God, equal with the infinite, omnipresent, omniscient, immutable, eternal, holy God. Jesus Christ is equal with the Father. Amen. And God the Holy Spirit is equal to God the Son and God the Father. God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit, one God in three distinct persons. I think one of the uh, scriptures that makes this, I, I hesitate to say understandable, but you certainly see the Bible teaches this. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now, did you hear that? He was with God as a distinct person, distinct from the Father. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. And in the Godhead, the Son submits himself to the Father. Now, he's equal to the Father. I love that passage of Scripture in Revelation chapter 5 when he came up and took the book from him that sits on the throne. He didn't ask for it. He took it as equal with the Father. Yet the Son submits himself to the Father. He's equal, but he submits. God the Holy Spirit is equal to God the Father and God the Son. Yet the Lord Jesus tells us with regard to the Holy Spirit, he shall not speak of himself. But what he hears, that shall he speak. He shall receive of mine and show it unto you. If you hear someone talking a whole lot about the Holy Spirit, a preacher, write this down. They don't know who the Holy Spirit is. The Holy Spirit speaks of the Son and glorifies the Son. The Lord said, he shall glorify me. That's his office. That is his purpose. Now, listen to this statement real carefully. The gospel is not preached. Let me say that again. The gospel is not preached. If the work of all three persons of the Godhead in salvation is not preached. 
the triune God, God the Father elects. He is the one who chose who would be saved before time began. They were chosen in Christ, according as he hath chosen us in him. Somebody says, you say you got you, you to preach election before you can preach the gospel? Yep, <laughs> you heard it. There's no gospel preaching without the glorious truth of God's electing grace. And the gospel is not preached if I don't give the work of the Son. I love the summary of his work in his own words. It is finished. Everybody he represented, he put away their sins and accomplished their salvation. The Bible knows nothing of a Savior that can be frustrated and his work not done. Everybody he died for must be saved. And if I don't preach that, I do not preach the gospel. And the work of the Spirit in regeneration must be preached. You must be born again. Now, if a preacher doesn't preach this, he doesn't preach the gospel. If a man doesn't believe this, he doesn't believe the gospel. You see, all three of these are essential in the salvation of the sinner. You believe that? They're all three essential, absolutely necessary in the salvation of the sinner. Now, let me ask you a question. Are they essential to you? Is it essential to you that God choose you and you know you won't be saved if it doesn't begin with his choice? Is it essential to you that Christ pay for all your sins and your salvation was accomplished by what he did without any reference to what you do? Is it essential that God the Holy Spirit comes to you and gives you spiritual life because you're dead? Essential. Now, it's essential. There's one God. One God in three distinct persons. And there's no earthly illustration that can teach us this. Somebody says, illustrate this. It can't be illustrated. One God and three distinct persons? This is just who he is, and it's something to believe. God reveals it. It is to be believed. You see, God is other. I love saying that about him. He's unlike anything me or you can even imagine. Who is like unto me? No one and no thing. There is one God revealed in three different persons. And here is the great commandment. Verse 30. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God. This is more important than anything else. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, and with all thy strength, this is the first commandment. Now that commandment comprehends all other commandments. And then he says in verse 31, the second commandment is like, namely this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Who's my neighbor? Everybody. Everybody. That's who my neighbor is. Everybody. And thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. All things whatsoever you would that men do to you, do ye even so to them. This is the law and this is the prophets. That's what God said. Um. This love is not a feeling. It's not really a feeling of affection even. It's doing to them what you would have them do to you. Now, this is the great commandment. Now, let's go on reading. Verse 32. And the scribe said unto him, after he gave the two great commandments, one God and loving your neighbor as yourself, this covers everything, and the scribe kind of throws us a curve at this time. He said unto him, well, master, well, master, 
That's a good answer. I agree with that. But notice what he calls him. Teacher. He thought the Lord was a great teacher. He thought the Lord was brilliant. Look at the way he shut us all up. We've all given him these uh, questions that we thought would trip him up, and he's tripped us up to where we can't say anything about him. Well, Master, what you said was good. I agree with it. Thou hast said the truth. For there is one God, and there's none other but he. Now, I couldn't help but thinking also of what James said, you believe there's one God, you do well. The devils believe the same thing. And they tremble. You do well. Just having your theology accurate here is not really going to do you any good. But he said, uh, you said, well, there really is one God, as if he's now instructing the Lord. There really is one God. I agree with that. Thou said the truth, for there is one God, and there's none other but he. And to love him with all the heart, with all the understanding, with all, with all the soul, and with all the strength, and to love his neighbor as himself is more than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. If you get all the ceremonies down right, if you have the right this and the right that and do it all right, loving God and loving your neighbor as yourself is much better than having all your uh, ceremonies and sacrifices and so on right. That's so. If I speak with the tongues of men and angels and have not love, it profits me. What? Nothing. Nothing. God is love, and he that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. He that loveth not knoweth not God. He that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? The answer is he can't. If any man say, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. Now, this man obviously had some sort of light, didn't he? Uh, he saw that this was more important than having uh, the right order of your ceremonies and your sacrifices and so on. Verse 34, and when Jesus saw that he answered discreetly, prudently, wisely, the Lord saw that. He said unto him, Thou art not far from the kingdom of God. Now once again, the title. How far is not far? What is the distance? Now one of the things that I think is very telling about this man is when the Lord said, you're not far from the kingdom of heaven, he didn't say, well, what do I need to do then? What am I missing? He just shut his mouth at that time. After that, no man dares to ask him a question. Now, if the Lord told me, you're not far from the kingdom of heaven, I'd want to know, well, what, if, what do I need to do? What, tell me, but not this man. He did not ask him any questions at all. But how far is not far? How far off is not far? What's the distance? I think of Herod. Scripture says Herod heard John the Baptist gladly. He was so impressed with the preaching of John the Baptist. And he did, the Scripture says, many things. Many things John said to do. He responded. He was certainly impressed with the preaching of John the Baptist, and with the person of John the Baptist. Scripture says he feared him, for he knew he was a holy man and just, and he did many things. How far was he after doing many things? How far was he? Well, you know that he had John the Baptist's head cut off. What about Felix? The Scripture says he trembled at Paul's preaching. He heard Paul preach, and he trembled. He was... He, he knew it was so. And he said, go thy way. For this time, when I have a convenient season, 
I'll call for thee. How far off was he? What about Agrippa? Agrippa said to Paul after he heard Paul preach, Almost persuadest thou me to be a Christian. I'm almost there. You've almost got me there. How far were they the same distance this man was? Now, if this man had any understanding, now he didn't reply, but if this man had any understanding of what the Lord was saying, he would have seen that he was in a constant state of breaking both of these commandments continually. He would have seen that. He would have known it was so concerning him. Now, somebody says, what is the worst sin? What's the worst sin? Everybody's thought that at one time or the other. What is the worst sin? Well, I suppose the worst sin would be breaking the greatest commandment. <laughs> Loving God with all your heart. All your, to fail to do that is to commit the worst sin. To fail to love your neighbor as yourself is to commit the worst sin. Now, you know what that means? That means me and you are in a state non-stop continually of always committing the worst sin. All the time, no stop, no break. There's no intermission. At all times, I've never loved God as he ought to be loved. And I've never loved my neighbors myself. And that is the commission of the greatest sin. And I am in the constant state of committing the greatest sin. Now, do you believe that about yourself? Believe it whether you uh, feel it or not. It's God's testimony concerning you. And all I got to do is point to the cross, and you'll find out how bad you are, not by looking within yourself and in your own heart, but by looking at what you would do if God took his hand off you, you would have murdered his son just like everybody else. Now, if this man would have understood what the Lord was saying, he would have said, I, I'm in a continual state of committing the greatest sin all the time. Now, this man had a sort of respect for the carpenter from Nazareth and even believed him to be a great and a brilliant teacher that nobody was able to trip up. But did he believe that he was the Christ? The answer is no. He believed him to be a great teacher, much like Nicodemus. Teacher, master, teacher. We know that thou art a teacher come from God. Because nobody can do what you do except God be with him. We know that. And I love the Lord's uh, response. Oh, I, I appreciate your affirmation. No, nothing like that at all. He said, you don't know anything. Except a man be born again, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. How far off was this man? Well, he'd not been born again. And without the new birth, without God causing life to be in you, a heart that was not there before, not just changing your old heart, but giving you a new heart, a heart of life, you can't enter the kingdom of God. The Lord said that. Except a man be born from above, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Not far will not bring you in. Not far is a long way. Turn with me to Luke chapter 13. I want you to look at this with me. Verse 1, there were present at that season some that told him of the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. Now these people were offering up sacrifices and Pilate had them put to death and mingled their blood with the blood of the sacrifices they were offering. Now these people must have been really bad. I mean, why would God let this happen to them? They must have been really bad people for this to take place. 
And Jesus answering said unto them, he knew what they were thinking, Suppose ye that these Galileans were sinners above all the Galileans because they suffered such things? They're the subject of the special judgment of God? I tell you, no. No. Now, there's no difference between men. No difference. No difference between the most moral, the most immoral. The Bible says that. Somebody says, how can you say that? Because the Bible does. There is no difference. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There is no difference. There's no difference in you. Look what he says in verse 4. Those 18 upon whom the tower in Siloam fell. He talked about a current event at that time. There was a construction project going on with a tower. And something went wrong and it fell in. Eighteen people working on it were killed. A current event. And then he asked this question. Do you think they were sinners above all men that dwell in Jerusalem? I tell you no. But except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. Now remember what this thing of repentance is. Uh, people, religious people think it's a change of behavior. Uh, I've, I've repented of my sins. I've straightened up and I'm flying right. I've turned over a new leaf. I've, I'm, I'm all for everybody straightening up and flying right. Don't get me wrong, but that, if that ain't what repentance is. Repentance is a complete change of mind about God. You've had low thoughts of God, wrong thoughts of God. Your mind's changed with regard to those. You've had too high thoughts of yourself and your own opinion and your own ability when you repent. You repent of that. And you repent of any thought of salvation that is any, in any way contrary to Jesus Christ being everything in salvation. You repent. Except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. And then the Lord said this in Matthew chapter 5, verse 20. <coughs> he said, um, Except your righteousness. Now you listen to this real carefully. Don't just let this go by you. Except your righteousness. Your personal righteousness. Exceed. Surpass. Be better than the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees. You shall in no case. Under no circumstance whatsoever enter into the kingdom of heaven. Now listen to me. This man didn't have the righteousness that our Lord is speaking of. If the righteousness of Jesus Christ is not your personal righteousness. Now don't let that just go over your head. Think about it. If the righteousness of Jesus Christ, his merit, his law keeping, his life before God, if his righteousness is not your personal righteousness. You shall in no case enter the kingdom of God. This man who was close, if he didn't have the righteousness of Jesus Christ, he is not getting in. Matthew chapter 18, verse 3, the disciples were arguing over which one of them would be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. You know, that argument came up a lot with these fellas. I mean, even right after the Lord's table, they were having this argument. Which one of us is going to be the greatest? Me. They, they, not him. I know that. It, might not, I, it wouldn't be me, but I, I'm dead sure it wouldn't be him. You know? I mean, I can see all the arguments they're having. And the Lord made this statement. And I, I feel like I've got more light on this statement than I have in the past. He said, except you be converted and become as little children, you shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, what is this thing of the faith of a little child? Now, little child, you, you all know my trick. You know, I mean, kids believe it. They believe it. How'd you do that? I mean, adults are, oh, how'd you do that? You know, uh, uh, you know, that's my trick. You know, and, I, and, I, and a little kid is gullible. And they believe it. Whoa, how'd he do that? How'd he do that? You know why? The kid's gullible. 
a child is gullible. They have a tendency to just believe what you tell them. And that's, that's, that's part of having a little, the faith of a little child. That's part of it. But understand this. We don't believe what Jesus Christ said because we're gullible. We believe what he said because he said it. No other reason is needed. We believe what he said because he said it. It's not gullibility. It's knowing that whatever he says must be true because of who he is. That's why we believe. Not because we're gullible, but because he said it. I think it's uh, interest, interesting. It's not the right word, but people, I mean, you, you all have heard this statement. God said it. I believe it. That settles it. Oh, no, no. God said it, that settles it, whether you believe it or not. Except ye be converted and become as little children, you shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. And then in John chapter 6, verse 44, the Lord said, no man can come to me. Well, don't miss that. No man can come to me. Well, I can come to Christ whenever I get ready to. No, you can't. <laughs> no, you can't. You know, somebody says, well, I'll, I'll, I'll get this taken care of tomorrow. No, you won't. No man can come to me. No man has the ability to come to me except the Father which has sent me draw him. Now, that word draw, let me tell you what it means. It means drag. Really? Really. Remember the way James uses it when he says, do not rich men draw you before the judgment seats? That doesn't mean they're bringing you in gently. They're yanking you in, and you're going to be judged because of that. This word, you will not come to Christ unless you're irresistibly dragged and drawn by the Father. And you know what? When he does it, you're going to come with full consent. <laughs> you're going to come because you want to. You see, he changes the want to, and you want to come to him. Now, the Lord said, except the Father, you won't. And this fellow here that was so close to the kingdom of heaven, he's not coming in unless the Father draws him in. And then he'll come in. He'll come in then, ain't no doubt about that, but not until the Father draws him. That's the irresistible, invincible grace of the Holy Spirit. I remember hearing a man say one time, I don't like that term, irresistible grace. I do. I do. I got no problem with it at all. That's the only kind of grace that'll save me is grace that is irresistible and invincible. I love the irresistible grace of God. Now, this man, he, he wasn't far, but he didn't have the Father drawing him in. John chapter 3, verse 27, the Lord said a man can receive nothing except it be given him from above. Now, you may not be far, but if you haven't received of the Father, as many as received him. Now, if you haven't received, what do you have that you didn't receive? Nothing. <laughs> Nothing. Everything you have, you received. Now, if you don't receive of the Father, then, like this fellow, you might be close, but you're oh so far away. A man can receive nothing except it be given him from above. And if you haven't received anything, let me say this. If you haven't received the gift of his grace, he never gave it to you. Everybody that he gives his grace to, you know what the evidence that he gave it to them was? They receive it. They receive God's way of saving sinners. They receive Christ as all. Why even the faith they have is a gift of grace they received. And they know it. The repentance they have, the perseverance they have is a gift of grace they've received. What do you have that you didn't receive? And the Lord said in John chapter 6, verse 53, except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. You might be standing outside the door seemingly pretty close. But except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in 
you. Now, that is the precise same thing as the just shall live by faith. That's what it is to eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood. The just, the justified, shall live. That's that life in you shall live by faith, looking to Christ only as everything in their salvation. The Lord said, Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, neither can you, except you abide in me. Now, it's, it's not enough for me to be close like that fellow was. I've got to be in the kingdom of heaven, abiding in Christ. Now, what does it mean to abide in Christ? Here's a real simple illustration. All God's favor and I know it's not. I'm using this as an illustration. All of God's favor is in this room. Outside of this room, there's no favor. Where you want to abide? I want to stay right here. All you could ever want or desire is in this room. Where you want to stay? Right here. Don't want to go anywhere else. Every believer only wants to be found in Christ. When God comes looking for me, I don't want him to see my prayers. I don't want him to see my understanding. I don't want him to see how well I've battled against sin and overcome. The no, all I want is for to be found in Christ. Not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faithfulness of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. And the last scripture I want to, give you is Romans chapter 9 verse 29 except the Lord of the Sabbath Sabbath had left us a seed we'd been like Sodom and like unto Gomorrah now you are familiar that the great sin of Sodom according to the scripture was where they were wanting to know the angels these men were uh, homosexuals the point is they were looking for something that could not produce life. And all this pictures is human religion. It cannot, it's got the act, but it cannot produce life. And the Lord said, except the Lord had left us a seed, we'd been just like them. We'd be in a religion that cannot produce spiritual life. So close yet so far. May the Lord enable me and you by faith to enter in to the kingdom of heaven. Let's pray. Lord, we would be in your son and Lord the only way we can be in your son is if you put us into your son we think of that scripture of him are you in Christ Jesus Lord we want to be in Christ Jesus of you bless what was said for your glory and for our good in Christ's name we pray Group.